Riot Club WWI dot com members. I'm standing by with this week's Radio Free Insanity guest, but of course you get to hear the interview first. Uh, he's gone by many names. You might know him as A-Train, uh, Albert, Prince Albert, uh, Giant Bernard, but that's paraphrase an old saying, uh, Rose by any other name would still kick your butt. Guys, join me in welcoming the one and only Giant Bernard, Matt Blue. Matt, welcome to the show, man. Hey, good to be here. Thank you for having me on. Now, we're glad to have you on. I, usually we start off these interviews and we ask people, you know, hey, what's been going on in your world? But a lot of fans already know what's going on in your world. You just completed a uh, very successful tour of Japan where, where yourself and uh, Tyson Tomko captured the uh, IWGP Tag Team titles. Yeah, we did. You know, it's something that uh, I've been in Japan now for two years. Uh, one year with all Japan, one year with New Japan. And uh, finally captured some gold, something that I've, you know, everyone gets in the business to do. And uh, I was able to do it. Pretty excited about it. That's awesome. And now you've had a lot of tag team partners. How is uh, how is Tyson as far as uh, a partner for you? Yeah, I've had a ton of tag team partners, actually. And, you know, uh, Tomko and I, we gel. You know, the good thing about that is we gel inside the ring as well as outside of the ring. He's a good guy, great guy. And uh, I enjoy working with him. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And we're having a blast out there. I couldn't be happy. I really couldn't be. That's awesome. See, I think what's cool is, and, and we've talked to other people, uh, Barry Buchanan we had on, for example, who went over to Japan. And when you're with WWE, you know, they, they keep trying to find gimmicks to work and what gimmick will work. But when you go to Japan, you know, I mean, you're a huge guy. You know, you don't necessarily need to, to, to be dancing and things like that. The fans there are just so in awe of your size that, uh, you know, you can go out there and, and just be yourself. You know, that, that, that's so the truth. With, with WWE and, and taking nothing away from them, it's a lot more theatrical. Uh, the, the gimmicks are needed. So, and as you said before, I had a ton, ton of terrible monikers. I mean, from, you know, Albert, Prince Albert, Hip Hop. I mean, they called me everything. And nothing really stuck. When I went out to Japan, they gave me a name. Let me just use my size and my athletic ability. And I said, run with it. And they gave me a shot. And uh, it's, I guess it's appreciated out there. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, that's all. One, of, one of the things, too, with your name, I remember uh, I remember seeing you first debut uh, with Roz as your partner, and I remember your name kind of fit the bill at the time, Prince Albert, uh, you know, teaming up with Roz, piercings, tattoos, but uh, I know a lot of people, I mean, myself included, it was kind of a kind of a weird thing because it's it's a, a piercing, but not exactly the uh, in a place that people usually like to talk about. What went through your mind when they first told you you were going to be named Prince Albert in WWF? You know, I chuckled, uh, but at the time, you know, when I had the opportunity to be with WWF, I really didn't care what they called me. I just wanted the opportunity to go out there and work and, and try to showcase my talents. And, uh, I mean, they could call me anything, and they called me a lot of things. And it, it was good. I didn't really mind. I chuckled. Mm -hmm. Mr. Russo came up with it. Uh, you know, that, that was his, that's how his mind works, I guess. And uh, we gave it a shot, and unfortunately things got cut short, as we all know why. Yeah. And, uh got switched to Albert, and then from there, we know the rest. Yeah, I mean, that was right. I mean, I think that you and uh, and, and Draws, early on, I mean, you guys, right off the bat, were one of my favorite tag teams, and I remember, I'm on Long Island, so so Draws' situation happened right out here. Uh, I mean, for you, when, when Draws w was injured in the ring and you knew that you had to kind of switch over, I mean, what was that like for you? It was so, still so early in your career to have something so major kind of, I mean, it sounds weird to say it happened to you, but, I mean, it, it, it affected your career. I mean, how, how was that for you in, in dealing with that situation? It was tough, you know, that was the first time that I've ever really, you know, I had dealt with death before, but I've never dealt with a good friend, and Draws and I were good friends, and we still are good friends, but it, it, it was a tough thing to see such a good guy uh, go from being such a, uh incredible outdoorsman, athlete, just all around, and still is a great person, but now he's just so limited, and it just happened like that, and it made me rethink my career, like, just something that I'm ready to, you know, take a chance, we all think we're invincible. And at a moment's notice, it could change like that for anyone, and that's what happened to Draws. And you know, so I really didn't really didn't think about where my career was going to go. I just kind of thought about, wow, this is the career that I want. Mm -hmm. And I did some praying, and uh, I felt like to you know, this is our only chance we have at this life, and I wanted to be happy, and wrestling makes me happy. So I just take my chances. But uh, as far as the business side of it, it you know, really put a wrinkle in which way we were going to go. I kind of had a storyline laid out for us, and that all changed at a moment's notice. Yeah. Well, I mean, then after that, they kind of, uh, you know, they, they started pulling back the Prince name, and you, and you became Albert. 
and you got a chance to, to begin a tag team of TNA before there was the promotion TNA. You, you were testing Albert along with uh, Trish Stratus, which a lot of people remember was her kind of her original introduction to WWE. Yeah, yeah that's Trish. That was her first uh, angle, and uh, I knew from day one Trish would be successful in this business. You know, when you combine beauty and brains, and uh, you're going to be successful. And she she played her cards well, and, and look at her now. She's one of the, the better dealers to come through that business. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and, and teaming up with Test as well. I mean, Test is one of those guys where it always kind of seemed like he was right on the cusp of, of being about to break into the next level and everything would get scaled back, that he would leave. I mean, did you did you expect, uh, as far as Test's career in, in the company, to uh, to go a little further than it did? Yeah, I don't understand. You know, I'm not sure what happened with Test's career. Uh, he obviously has the ability to be a top star. I mean, he looks great. I think he's a pretty good worker in the ring. Uh, I, I'm, I don't know what happened this last time uh, with him getting released. Uh, I'm, I was kind of shocked, to be honest with you. Uh, I was shocked that he got released in the first place and, and the way he got released. I mean, he was out with a neck injury. Yeah. And then uh, he got the opportunity to come back, and I thought, you know, well, things are going to work out for him. I, I don't get to see much uh, at WWE or ECW now being in Japan all the time, but, you know, I've heard that. He was really tearing it up, and then the next thing I noticed, my father called me and said he got released, and I was shocked. So, you know, I, I guess it is a shock to see how his career is going. I mean, it, it's always kind of been like that with, with WWE. I mean, they, they treat people right when they're there, but one of the weird things is that sometimes these releases happen, and, and no one sees it coming. You know, it'll just be one day somebody's, you know, on a show. or Sylvester Turkai was, you know, on SmackDown on, on a Friday and then released on a Monday. It was just such a, a weird thing. For you yourself, when you were released, I mean, did you kind of know it was coming, or was it was it more of a surprise to you? No, uh, truthfully, uh, truthful, I mean, they weren't doing anything with me. Okay. But, um, you know, at the time, you know, uh, I was out on injury. I blew my shoulder out, and I just had surgery, and I was about a month away from getting cleared to come back. And I was, you know, going full steam ahead. I was working on a ring out here in Arizona. I was getting in shape, and I was trying to come back in probably the best shape I've been in. And uh, I got a call at 8 in the morning from uh, Johnny Ace, and, he told me they were letting me go, so it was kind of like a, a shock to me. But you know, I, I, at the, at, for about a, for about a day, I was I was angry, I was bitter. But I realized that hey, you know, it's, this is business, and uh, you know, if you're not putting asses in seats, you're not making Vince money. And Vince is a businessman, and that's how he operates. And I wasn't obviously putting asses in seats. They were trying to find gimmicks for me that weren't weren't working, and uh, he decided to let me go. I didn't see it coming, I, you know, mm -hmm. but. It's always a possibility, as we know. Well, I think what was surprising, too, is that you were coming off of uh, probably your most successful run there. I mean, before before the injury, when you when you became A-Train, uh, and you kind of you know changed your gimmick around a little bit. When, when you got the name A-Train, uh, I mean, I know Devon Dudley, actually, we, we had him on, and we talked about it, too, because that was one of his original wrestling names. But for you, what did you think of the name A-Train? And, uh, I mean, did you see it as an opportunity to finally kind of branch out from the Albert gimmick? Yeah, I did. You know, uh, Paul Heyman came up with it for me. Uh, I felt I felt it was you know a, a name doesn't really get someone over, but I felt it was a name that could stick with me. Um, I liked my introduction uh, coming down the you know out of down the stage. I thought I thought everything would kind of fit in gel. Uh, it started going well, but then things just uh, things just ended. You know, I, I hurt myself. Got re you know they got injured and they got released. So never really got to get that A train going. I had a few months of it, but. You know, I had some good runs with Edge and Rey Mysterio, okay. and uh, it just kind of ended. Well, I, th I think actually at that point in your career, you you were involved in uh, in a feud with Chris Benoit that I think a lot of yeah. people finally got a chance to really really see what you could do uh, as far as you know in a wrestling match because the two of you went out there and, and I you know I think a lot of people were saying you know well you know this is a, an opportunity blah blah but you went out there with Chris and you guys put on a great match on on television I think it was on a pay per view right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it, I don't think it's even possible to have a bad match with Chris Benoit. I, I would say he is probably the best worker in the business when it comes to in-ring technique. I mean, he's just unbelievable, and he'll make anyone look good. And, you know, it's funny, because the time that I started to angle with Chris, I was kind of down. I really didn't, I was kind of losing my confidence with wrestling. I didn't think that I was ever going to, you know, we all go into this into the business to become the best. And, you know, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be the best best big man, and I started to have my doubts, and I got put in this angle with Benoit, and he just built this confidence about me that really made me feel good, and 
I enjoyed working with him. I tell you, that was some of my most brutal. I, I mean, I, I was sore as hell when they were done, but it was most gratifying matches I had. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of like a, a different thing. There was there was less focus on uh, on kind of the, as you said before the theatrics of it, and it was more. Uh, I don't want to say Japanese style, but in, in the sense that it was based on just two guys going out there and wrestling as opposed to, you know, you ran over my, my dog or something like that. Right. It, you know, it really, it, it, you said it best. You said it isn't, but I, I really think it was a Japanese style. And there were years before Benoit would mention to me that when I was kind of stagnant out doing anything, he's like, you should give Japan a shot. And I just felt, I don't want to walk some guaranteed money. You know, I'm starting a family here. This might not be a good idea. And he said, I'm telling you, you'd really make your niche out there. And, God, I wish I did it when he said it, you know, yeah. years younger. Because uh, Japan is it's the place for me, you know. That's awesome. I, I mean, was well, it weird to be out in Japan? Because we've asked a lot of the guys who did tours out there. I mean, it's it's rough. I mean, you go into a country that's you know, kind of completely different language-wise and, and culture-wise. The, the first time you went out there and started working tours, was it, was it a tough adjustment period, getting used to uh, everything over there? Yeah, you know, when I first went out there, I was with All Japan, and uh, I, I, had, I had, you know, Chuck Palumbo, Johnny Stromboli, Umaga was out there, uh, um, Bull Buchanan, D'Lo Brown, so there were a lot of, as they said, guy Jane foreigners out there that we all rode in the same bus. It was easy. It was easy for me to get acclimated. When I made the switch to New Japan, I was the only American at the time because Scott Norton was finishing up his run out there. So that's when, it was funny because when I first walked to Japan, I wasn't too nervous because I had a comfort. I had a blanket up there of other people I knew. But when I switched to New Japan, I was the only American. And I didn't really didn't know the language well. I learned the basics of it, but I didn't have to learn it too much because I pretty much, you know, kept myself with the Americans and a few of the Japanese guys that spoke good English. But when I to New Japan, it, it was, that was strange. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be like, I mean, it, it's almost like some of these uh, foreign wrestlers that come to the United States and, you know, you watch them in WWE and you think, you know, does, does anyone understand this person? <laughs> Do they have anyone who, who speaks the language? It, it's got to be, it's kind of like a reverse of what Tajiri went through over here. It is, you know, it's funny because I see Tajiri and, uh, you know, I see Taco a lot. Uh, I have respect for them to come over here and, you know, Taco came over here and it didn't know the language at all. He learned the language and... It's, 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 you know, cultural, it's a lot different. So I have a lot of respect for those guys to come over and, and make the switch. Yeah. Well, I'm also, you're huge. I mean, I'm, you know, in, in a way, as, as a wrestler, you're, you're a huge guy. And over there in Japan, it's always kind of been like, uh, you know, the bigger American wrestlers are, are huge attractions. Vader, Stan Hansen, uh, Terry Gordy, and you're, you're kind of of that cloth in that, you're, you know, you're a big, imposing guy that, that looks very different than a lot of the, uh, the Japanese wrestlers out there because you, you tower over most of them. Yeah, uh, by no means do I feel like I'm in the, in the same name as the Hansen or Gordy or, you know, even Vader or Norton yet, but that's my goal. But, you know, I went out there thinking I'm going to be the biggest guy out there, and there's some big boys out there. I mean, I work with Aki Bono a lot, and, and I mean, he's, he's a grand champion, so he's huge. I got some other guys out there, Nakanishi, who is a Japanese guy who, I mean, he's a jack, big guy. He's about 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, I mean, he's a big kid, and I was shocked. There are some big boys out there. Yeah. It's uh, it, it, a lot of people. I think t tend to look at the uh, the Japanese wrestlers who come to America, and they say, you know, oh, they're all cruiserweights, they're all uh, they're all high flyers. But I mean, it, it's mixed up no matter where you go. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me ask you about your about your look because one of the things that uh, any fan who hasn't seen you in Japan yet might not realize, you're now in Japan. You, you, you're not really sporting the uh, you know the, the hairy chest and the hairy back, but more so uh, you have tattoos. You have the uh, the whole tribal over over the front, uh, you know, your torso. What was the decision like to, to get the tattoos? Did you think it was more like kind of like being reborn in your career, or was it something that you always wanted to do but couldn't because of your gimmick? In, uh, you know, something I always wanted to do uh, when I first, my first time, before I even signed with WWF, it's something I wanted to do. I mean, the same idea I had, but, uh, you know, I got signed with WWF and I started wrestling, so I really didn't have time to take off and, to, you know, get tattooed and had the opportunity to do it. And then, you know, I came to WWF and I shaved my back. And Vince saw me with the hairy back and hairy chest. And I shaved my back and I shaved my chest one day and he said, don't do it again. We like the back, you know, hairy back and hairy chest. And, you know, I didn't want to piss off the boss, he's the one who's paying me, so, you know, I had to do it, did not want to keep the hairy back and hairy chest, but that's what Vince wanted, so, uh, once I was, able, once I got released and had time off, 
I said, here's my opportunity to do this. They shaved everything, and I, I went to the tattoo parlor and got what I wanted to do. And I'm not close to being done with what my image of my tattoo I wanted to look like, but it's just something I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted the piercings, I've always wanted the tattoos, and I'm just taking advantage of it now. But, you know, unfortunately, I'm booked on every tour in Japan, so I don't have time to finish what I, want, what I started, but oh, yeah. someday I will. Well, and there's also the, there's a few days of that, that soreness, and the last thing you need is to, to be thrown on the mat and have, uh, you know, sore tattoos getting slammed into it. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying, like, well, also when you get tattooed, yeah, you have to wait a few days because it's sore and it's red and you can't really touch it or anything like that. So, I mean, people oh, yeah. who don't have tattoos might not realize, but once you get it, you have to wait, you know, at least a few days before you go back into the ring again and you'll screw it. Yeah, you just have to, you know, when I first got my, when I was down in, uh, my son was just, uh, when I signed with WWE, they sent me down to Memphis, and that's when I first got my, Russells are a strange breed, so, you know, I first got my, my nipples pierced, yeah. and, you know, I, I put tape over them because they would kill me, and I talked to the guys, and I said, guys, do me a favor, please don't, you know, chop me in the chest, hit me in the chest in the nipple area, and they're like, yeah, no problem, no problem. Well, that's the worst thing to tell a wrestler, because they're all sick, they're sick individuals, and that's, that was now I just put a target on my chest, and they just lit it up, so I learned my lesson there. <laughs> about sore nipples before you get in the no, ring. No, just don't let them know because they will attack them. <laughs> well, one of the other gimmicks you had in, in WWE, which kind of was uh, the one that stands out because it was so different than the other ones you were playing, you, you teamed up with Scotty Too High for a while. And it yeah. kind of was like uh, a bit of the Rikishi thing in that you were the giant with the, with the smaller guy, but you were playing the, the gimmick that he was playing as a hip-hop hippo. Um, yeah, what was that for you going from the, from the gimmicks that you had been doing to that gimmick? Uh, what was that like? I mean, were you, were you happy about it, or were you just like... You know, uh, you know when, I first, when I was first told the idea, I I really, I cringed, not to lie, I cringed, and I, you know, I went to Vince, and I, you know, I had this whole plan laid out, and I told Vince, you know, I don't want to be a second at Rikishi, because Rikishi really tore it up in that gimmick, and to be a second at is not good, you know, I went and I told Vince, and... You know, Vince could sell ice to an Eskimo. I mean, he, he, I walked out of that, that meeting thinking that, you know, people are people are going to call you on the next road warriors. Okay. And, uh, so, you know, I, I, I went out there, I gave it a shot. I think it was, uh, I think it was a foolish gimmick to stick a six foot seven, throwing a 50 pound guy into that type of mode. I don't know if anybody wanted to see a different side of me, if I could do it, or someone in the back wanted to get a good laugh out of it. Who knows? But, uh, you know, I always took my job seriously. If they wanted me to do something, I wanted to do it. I learned my lesson. I think if that was to happen now, I'd probably put a little, I'd kibosh it, but, you know, you live and learn. I don't regret what I do. I always regret what I don't do. Awesome. That's a good way to kind of look at things, because actually right after that, you, you began, as we said before, probably the, the highlight of your WWE career, where you actually have... Are, are kind of made history in a way because I think you could honestly say you're the only man in the world who has fought both Aki Bono and Stephanie McMahon. I don't think anyone else can possibly even say that. And, and to yeah. me, I mean, watching you go in there and wrestling Stephanie, all I kept thinking is what what goes through the mind of, of a guy your size to go in there with the boss's little girl and have to have a match? I mean, was, how nerve-wracking was that for you, worrying that you might, you know, smack her in half or something like that? Oh, man, I was, it was, I was stressful. I, you know, I, uh, you don't want to hurt the boss's daughter. And I remember Fitz Finley and I were talking about some things I could do to her and we were working on some things. And, you know, it was, <laughs> we definitely said no to a lot of things, you know. But uh, it was an experience. Uh, it was great because that was the first time that I felt that I was really put into an important angle that the company was depending on. It felt good to have that. But uh, it was nerve-wracking, to say the least. Yeah. I mean, what was it like working with her as far as being in the ring with her? I mean, is, is she kind of easygoing as far as what, what you can do? Did, did you feel that, uh, you know, she, she was up for the challenge or was it the kind of thing where you... Yeah, oh, no, she was great. You know, I remember doing a few pre-tapes in the back with her where I had to, you know, uh, you know almost grope her. And uh, she was really for it and all. And uh, she was really outgoing. And she's a good, you know, and, you know, I knew her for a short time. And in the ring, she was very, very uh, open to ideas. And we could Leave it at that, I guess. No, that's cool. Yeah, she. Uh, I, I remember that whole that whole period. It was it was you. It was you know Brock Lesnar was involved with all that stable, uh, and Brock is kind of the hot button uh, of WWE leaving the company and going to Japan. And, and you've worked with him over in Japan. Uh, I mean, the, as far as his career goes, I mean, are you are you surprised at how it's turned out? And, and do you think that in the long run, now he's doing MMA, that this might have been uh, 
maybe a not necessarily a good move, but he's made the best out of the situation. You know, Brock and I, at one time, we were pretty close. Um, and I remember him telling me that he was going to make the leave, the jump from uh, Russell. He wouldn't do it anymore. And, you know, I said it before, this is an address rehearsal. This is our life. And I told him that. And it's the only chance you get. And if you're not happy doing this, I mean, the kid walked away from a lot of money. Yeah. So I give him credit for doing that. He had a, a like, huge opportunity. Vince loved him. He paid him good money. But he wasn't happy. And if you don't, how many people do that? Many people get stuck in the same old job every day, day in, day out, not happy. And it becomes just like, they become robots. And Brock wasn't happy. He made the most good opportunity. He made the jump. Do I think he did it the right way? No, I don't. Mm. But, uh, you know, he wasn't happy, and he did what he had to do. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Well, he was one of those guys, too, I think, in, in the business, and, and we see it a lot with people. I mean, you, you had a, a you know a strong history getting into the industry and, and you know, you know past accomplishments before WWE, but it seems typical a lot of times where guys kind of come in and, and they get signed very early on in their career and, and they show up there that they don't realize how, how hard it is for some guys to get to the position that they're in because it was, I don't want to say easy for them, but, you know, they kind of walked into it early on in their career. I would probably say that I was the beginning of that. They have any opportunity pretty quick because, you know, when I hear stories about, you know, like, uh, Eddie Graham made a refuge piece or Ben Wah and these guys who put years and years and years into the business where, you know, I came out of, uh, football, I started teaching. I was probably trained for wrestling for a year and a half before I got the opportunity to, to get signed by WWF. So I think I was the beginning of that time where they really gave guys an opportunity pretty quickly. And now I hear about these guys that, they just look great and they're giving opportunities and I think that's a shame. I think you gotta pay some type of dues and for me to say that, I mean, I kind of cringe because I really didn't pay the dues that I, that some of my people that I really respect in this business have paid. But when I hear stories of people that just have great bodies and they're given these great opportunities, I, I, I cringe a little bit about that. I don't think they appreciate the business and then, then they end up leaving, talking bad about the business and, and so forth. Yeah, no, totally. Well, I mean, you also, I mean, with, with your own career, you were in a position kind of different. It was it was sort of getting to the end of that territory system where, you know, for years in, in the 80s and 90s, guys would have to wrestle in, you know, high school gyms for 11 years before getting kind of signed. And by the time you started, uh, you know, getting into the industry, it was starting to blow up a little bit, and, and there was a lot more opportunities for people who, uh, who were already getting into it. Yeah, that's the truth. You know, I was in the right place at the right time. I came in at the, you know, right before, you know, DX just was pumping, uh, Austin, Rock. I mean, it was a great time. And, you know, I've done, a, I don't do too many interviews, but every time I do, I tell, you know, the time that I came in, you know, Crash Hall and me, rest in peace, we would talk about this one time. And everyone who walked down that ramp was a WWE superstar, or WWF superstar. I mean, if you were on Heat, you had an angle on Heat. If you were on Velocity, well, I don't know if it was Velocity then, but whatever program it was, you were a WWE superstar. Where now I think, the, and I don't get to see it as much anymore, but when I was released and I watched it, I felt like the show was really based around a, a few superstars rather than the whole roster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was different than, than, I mean, the late 90s, it kind of seemed like everyone had a bit yeah, of a story. Yeah, the dynamics are, are much different now. Yeah, I mean, was that, was that frustrating at times? I mean, I you know nothing bad against the company, but one of the things that, especially in your time there around 2002, 2001, it was kind of known for having a bit of a glass ceiling where there was only so high you could go before you kind of get pushed back down again. Uh, I mean, for you, was there ever any time when you were like, God, how much do I have to do to, to finally get to that level? Yeah, you know, I, 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 uh, I tell you, I got, probably the most frustrated I got was uh, right before I won the Intercontinental Championship. I won a Madison Square Garden. I won against Kane. I thought, wow, this is an opportunity for me now that I think I really might have, you know, I didn't break into the next level, but I was on that doorstep to get there. Mm -hmm. I was walking up the porch steps, and uh, all of a sudden we bought WCW. Yeah. And I just was like, oh, wow. Like, where they, you know, I, I, they were telling us that it was opportunity. We'd have more time slots. I didn't see that like that. I, I think competition is good. I thought it was more people, less TV time. And I, I thought, I'm, I'm in trouble now. And I pretty much was. But I think I defended that in a home championship like three times on Heat and lost it on Raw to Lance Storm. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that was really the most frustrated I began. I started to get in my career. Well, I mean, were you surprised with how, how the WCW buyout turned out? Because I think a lot of people were expecting, you know, probably the biggest angle in wrestling. You know, it was another promotion kind of coming to WWE, and in the end it's, 
kind of looked at by a lot of people as, as kind of a failure on their part because they never really capitalized. I mean, did you expect them to go further with what they did with it, uh, or did, were you kind of just like, no, well, I didn't. I, I didn't expect them to go further. Truthfully, I, I'm a huge believer in competition brings out the best in people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fans, they're not stupid anymore. They know, like, they tried to make it two different entities, but they, they know it's not two different entities. Vince controlled everything. Yeah. And that's a tough thing, you know. Uh, if anyone could do it, it begins on these creative genius, but that's a tough thing to do. Mm -hmm. To try to fool people into thing as two different entities and all that talent to get them on two TV shows for two hours apiece, it was tough. And uh, I, I didn't think it was a good thing, and that's why I really hope, like this TNA, I hope it takes off. And I think if you were to ask a lot of the wrestlers in the industry today if they were being truthful with you, they all hope it would take off. Mm -hmm. I even think some people in WWF hope it things to take off just because competition is good. That's when that's when Russell was at the greatest during the rating wars with WCW and WWE. I mean, everyone had to think to be on top of their game. They had to wrestle hard. The, the creative teams in the back had to be on the cutting edge. Yeah. Where now, they're more lax. Oh, totally. Well, I mean, I think the thing, too, is that when, when WCW was around, you would have a guy in WWE that, you know, would do his thing for a while, and then he would kind of get a little stale, and his career would start to hit a snag. So they'd release him, he'd go to WCW, they'd reinvent him, and then he'd get over again, and they'd bring him back. And it was kind of like this continuous cycle of guys leaving, getting over again, coming back, getting over again. And, and there was always opportunity to keep yourself on TV and, and kind of reinvent your character. And now it's kind of like, you know, you're with WWE, you get stale, they keep you around for a while, and then they'll release you, and then, you know, it, it, it doesn't really give you the opportunity to go anywhere else in the United States, show yourself to the fans, and, and kind of uh, improve the character that you had. It's tough. I, I tell you, the, the, it's, it's, you know, I would never tell people to not, you know, chase their dream, but the rustling, and hopefully it starts getting better now because of TNA, but the rustling industry now is a tough business to get into, mm. and even tougher to succeed in. Oh, yeah. Because there's so few, there's so many people want to do it, but now there's just so few slots with one company. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's changed a lot. There was a time when, uh, you know, in the 80s, you know, everyone says, you know, pays your dues, but a lot of those guys, you know, they're talking about hundreds of people were, were in the circuit because there were promotions, you know, on every block, you know. Exactly. You're yeah, so right. So true. Well, that was, uh, I, think, I think Kevin Nash had said it. We had him on in, uh, in January, and he had said that when he first got into the industry, you know, he was doing 300 days a year and getting out there, and, and even not even with your character, but getting experience. And he would get experience in front of a crowd working 300 days a year. And he said nowadays anybody, you know, who's not in WWE, they're kind of lucky to get half of that in the United States. Yeah, he, he, he said it, that's the truth right there, and, and, and he knows because, you know, he's done it all. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, have, have you gotten to see any of TNA? I mean, if, if they were to call you tomorrow and, and ask you to, to to come and uh, and maybe work with them, I mean, would that be something you'd be interested in? Or yeah, of course. You know, I I, I, I never I never burn any bridge. I never close any door. I, I always leave them open to see what happens. I take advantage of any opportunity. Um, I, I'm a little bit smarter in the business now. I I, I kind of look to see what they had in the future for me rather than living in the moment. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we know this business, you need to know how, what are the legs a character has or the idea has. I don't want to be a flash in the pan. So, of course, I, you know, I, I think they're a great company. I, you know, Tom goes there a lot now. I, I, I don't get to see too much of it. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, there are great guys there from Christian to Angle. I mean, Samoa Joe. There's a lot of quality workers there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity to have, uh, have good matches, yeah. You know, I just, I, I hope that they get some more time. I heard a rumor that they're trying to get some more time. I think an hour of a show is tough to do mm -hmm. when you have such good talent. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, it's important for them to get another time slot. If they're able to do that, that'd be great. Well, I, th I think what's really tough for them, and I think that, uh, that a lot of people realize that this week, WWE kind of, they, they did the brand split where they have now three brands, ECW, Raw, and SmackDown. And when you just watch each show, you kind of say, well, you know, TNA's got a bunch of guys, WWE has, you know, a few guys too. But then this past week, they recombined all the all the rosters for the pre-WrestleMania show. And you watch it and you say, wow, my God, look how many, you know, main event talents they have, how many top stars they have in WWE. And it kind of feels like in a way that, I don't say there's too many, but there's so many people that they have right now waiting that you have to wonder as time goes on if, if there's a cut and, and they go to TNA, it could majorly shift the balance of, uh, you know, of wrestling right now. I think it could. I think it could. I mean, you got you got guys out there like, uh, you know, Val Venus. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think he's great. And what, what has he done lately? Nothing. I think given the opportunity at a different company, I think Val would take off. Yeah. 
You know, I mean, he's an incredible worker. He's good on a stick. But, you know, they're not doing anything with him because they have so much talent there. It's tough for that creative team to write everyone in. And that's a two-hour slot. Yeah. I mean, they, it's funny, too, because they have, like, eight hours of TV a week. But it's it's yeah, there's right. so many guys, you know, to get on there and, and do that. And Val almost comes up every time we we interview somebody on that subject. They, they You know, Dilo has brought him up. A lot of people have brought up Val Venus. But Val actually has uh, kind of a similar situation that you had in WWE. You know, he was he's a quality performer. He was the kind of guy that was there for a while. But right off the bat, he was given a gimmick and a moniker that a lot of people in the company, you know, they keep saying, well, oh, now he's going to be Val Venus forever. It's hard to get a gimmick like that off of him. And I remember with you especially, even Jim Ross in his Ross report was saying, you know, Albert, you know, uh, will, will, we have, will we ever be able to get the name, you know, off of off of that character, or is it too ingrained? I mean, is Val in the position where everybody knows his character, and, and it's going to be hard to to get him over in WWE again, uh, you know, unless he's Val Venus? No, I just, uh, there's always a way, and Vince can always think of a way. Of course, I can think of some ideas off the top of my head. I mean, you know what, have him come out and say, hey, listen, I am not Val Venus, I'm Sean, you know, you know and, and this is what I am. I mean, go out there and just... It, do what Benoit does. Benoit doesn't have an angle. Benoit doesn't have a gimmick. He's just Chris Benoit. He fights tooth and nail, and people respect him because he puts 100% effort into it. He fights his ass off, and people like that. And Val can do the same exact thing Benoit does. Absolutely. No, totally. Well, I mean, they're like, yeah, hey, just shave your head. Maybe that'll change things a little bit, and they throw him back out there on heat. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I mean, you sound like somebody, I mean, you, you know a lot about the industry, and it sounds like, you know, in, in your career, you've, as, as you said before, got smartened up, but. Uh, growing up, did you, did you watch wrestling before you got into it? Were you a fan? Oh, I was a huge fan, huge uh, fan. I used to drag my father to the Boston Garden, and he would he would cringe, but I saw a lot of TV shows. But, you know, I didn't watch too much. At the time, it was WWF. I didn't get to watch too much. It, it came on a lot up in New England, uh -huh. but I just, I wasn't a big fan of it because it was always, as we know now, like squash matches. Yep. And I used to watch world-class championship wrestling with the Von Arrows and the Freebergs and and so forth and so on. And that, to me, was, that's what really kind of glued me to wrestling because yeah, I thought it was always good matches. Like, I, it wasn't, you didn't know, I, you didn't know who the winner was going to be. Mm -hmm. Where I could watch WWF or WWF at the time, and I knew that Andre the Giant wasn't going to lose, or Hulk Hogan wasn't going to lose. Yep. And I knew that, you know, maybe the Brooklyn Ball wasn't going to win. So, it was more predictable. That's why I enjoyed it. But I always watched wrestling. I loved it. I wanted to do it forever. But it's, it sounds like you, like you and I have almost uh, an identical kind of way we got into the business because I, I had watched WWF. I live in New York, so it was WWF, like, all in the state. But I, I, I agree with you. I used to watch world-class championship wrestling because it was on TV. I think it was on ESPN for a while and, and different channels. And it, it was kind of like opening the door because you're so used to kind of the glitzy style of, of WWF TV. And then you watch world-class, and there was no – it wasn't so glitzy, but it, it was pure wrestling, and, and there wasn't a lot of that on TV at the time. Yeah, I agree. Totally. I mean, that, that's it in a nutshell right there. Well, who were some of your influences coming up? Like people that you watched on, on television and maybe, you know, uh, made, made you want to get into the industry or wrestlers that you, that you enjoyed watching? I mean, we all watched Hogan. I loved watching him. Uh, bon er I, I loved Jerry Von Eric at the time. Uh, Terry Gordy. Uh, you know, I started to get older. I to take her. I, you know, a lot of respect for him, how he keeps reinventing himself. But as a young boy, uh, you know, probably Hogan and Von Eric were the guys that I was like, wow, I wanted to be like them. Yeah. Well, Kerry was, I remember when Kerry came to uh, to WWF and they, they started teaming up with the Ultimate Warrior and it kind of seemed like like a cool thing for a while, but it, it was always kind of like they didn't let him speak that much. He didn't really, you know, he just went out there and, and kind of wrestled his matches and, and it seemed like, uh, I never really felt like he was used properly in, in, as a Texas Tornado. Yeah, you know, as we know, I mean, you could, Microphone work goes miles with WWF. If you don't get that opportunity, people don't ever get to really learn your character and who you are and what you're trying to represent. And you know, if you're just out going out there wrestling, it's it's a it's a it's a steep hill to climb to to get people to acknowledge what you're trying to get across. No, oh, absolutely. Uh now, we usually ask all of our guests kind of the same question. Like, knowing your skills and, and, and your style in the ring, if you can go back and, and you can have a match with anybody who you never locked up with in their prime, maybe somebody you grew up watching, someone before you, somebody who you haven't gotten a chance to wrestle yet, uh, and you say to yourself, I could probably have a great match with that person, uh, who would you pick and why? Oh, man, there's so many. Of them. That's a tough question. Uh, yeah, everyone's – I mean, you could I mean, put more than one out there. I mean, whatever, you know. 
you know, I'd like to work Vader in his prime or Hanson in his prime. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to work Ben Warren. His, you know, I think it's his prime, but I'd love to work him again. Big boss man. Um, it's always have fun working with Rey Mysterio because that's a fun match. <laughs> and Hogan would be cool. Uh, there's just so many of them, and I don't think I have one particular dream match. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm with, I think a lot of fans, too, that uh, of today don't even realize. I remember as a kid watching Vader in, in Japan and WCW, and he was, you know, he was a monster. Back when The Undertaker was first starting to do the Invincible thing, Vader was already ingrained as the Invincible monster. And it, and it kind of seems like a lot of fans today might not realize that because of, uh, you know, some of his later stints in, in WWF. But Vader was, I mean, he was a monster. Vader was, I mean, there was a guy who was, you know, six foot four, 300 plus plus, and he was agile, he could move in the ring and do some really, I mean, he did a moonsault that was, was beautiful, I mean, mm -hmm. he, uh, he, he, in his prime, he can go. Yeah. You know. I, I mean, to this day, I think of the Joe Thurman thing when he broke the guy's back on, uh, on Worldwide, it was like. Yeah, I remember that, I remember that. I, don't know. I think I still have it on tape somewhere, and, and you see this fan in the, in the front row just jumps up and holds his head like, holy crap, <laughs> it was just terrible. <laughs> Absolutely nuts, man. Uh, I mean, did, did you watch WCW uh, before you got into the business? Was that something that you were a fan of? I know it was on TBS out by, out by us. Uh, you know, I watched it, you know. Um, it, 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 when I was in college, you know, I, I'd, I'd watch it. But it really didn't get huge until the rating war started, and that's right when I kind of finished college. Yeah. I mean, as a fan, too, in the industry, and I ask a lot of people who, who grew up as fans and got into the wrestling business, what, when you first got into it and you got a chance to meet some of these guys that, that you watched, uh, you know, as a kid and, and learn from them, you know, in a way, because WWF was still very heavy on, on bringing in legends and still is to this day. Uh, I mean, as, as a wrestling fan, to get into the industry and get to learn from these people, what was that like for you? Was it the first time you stepped into a, a locker room and dealt with that? It was, uh, it was awing. To say the least, you know, I remember the first time I walked in the locker room and uh, I actually sat down and I was getting my bag under it out, you know, all unpacked and all, and, and here comes Hogan. It was a little later into my career, so I've already been around the likes of, you know, the Shawn Michaels, the Diesels, the Undertakers, who I was all also in awe of meeting them for the first time, but looking up and seeing Hulk Hogan sitting next to me, and I was like, wow, this is pretty cool, and, you know, I pretty much stuck my foot in my mouth. I, said, I used to watch you when I was a little kid. <laughs> Taker is, you know, one of the best in the business, and 
and, and, and making good matches. And then you have uh, Cena and Michaels. And, and Michaels, I think that'll be a good match. I mean, Shawn Michaels is one of the best in business. His team's coming along pretty good. John just is uh, what did he do well and what he can't do well. And I think that's Trump and McMahon, man. Who is Maga versus who? Uh, Bobby Lashley. You know, there's a guy last coming through. Yeah. I was actually in a, a talk show showed me a thing when I was in Japan of Lashley jumping through the cage in a manga, and I was so impressed. It was a great spot, right, when, when they knocked the whole cage? It was unbelievable. I mean, that pops, and it, it takes a while to get me to pop now, because I think, yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen it all. Yeah. Yeah, but it was pretty cool to see that, and uh, I think that'll be a good match. You know, I, I don't know much of the other kind. There's only three matches that I know. Oh, uh, yeah, they have, um, I mean, there's another Money in the Bank match this year where, you know, they go for the ladder match for the uh, title yeah. shot, and there's, like, uh, eight guys, like the Hardy, CM Punk, um, who else, Booker is in it, I think Finley, Ken Kennedy. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's a pretty star card this year, and it kind of seems like they're going full steam ahead because they have kind of that celebrity endorsement, and it always seems like what's cool about WWE, we, we come down on them a lot on our site sometimes when, when creatively they hit flaws, but when they have something really good to promote, I mean, they promote it to the hilt, and they do whatever they can to kind of frame it as best they can to the mainstream. Oh, WWE is good at promoting. I agree with you. Sometimes they might drop the ball on some ideas, but when it comes to getting something out to the public, they are the best at that. Absolutely. Well, Matt, before I let you go, uh, last thing we give every one of our guests the opportunity to speak to their fans, people who have followed them for years, following their careers now and, and since the day they began. So what do you have to say to all your, uh, your little Bernards, I guess we can call them? Well, there aren't many of them, but if there are some of them, I appreciate, you know, all you guys have uh, booed me, cheered me, followed me, and uh, if you get an opportunity to watch some uh, of my New Japan stuff, I think you'd enjoy it, and uh, thanks, guys, and uh, thanks to all the fans out there who aren't Bernard fans who keep following wrestling and supporting it. Awesome. Guys, uh, well, Matt, before, uh, I just want to thank you once again for taking the time, and, uh, and yeah, thanks for joining our show this week. Hey, bro, I appreciate you having me on.